How's life? Good. Life is good. Yeah? Life is good. Yeah, and I hope it is for you. It's good. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious uh, how you see the tech industry is, uh, uh, since the – Will you turn up my headphones just a bit? Collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. I, I, I think that has changed from my view. Uh, uh, the whole – it has, you know, tech industry and and yeah. how banks finance, how how they interact with the funds, and uh, I don't know if anyone's going to replace Silicon Valley Bank in the role that it did, which is a shame in my view. Yeah, it's interesting, huh? What what is your take on that? How, why do you think all that happened? Do you think like it was actually, was it like a run on the bank? Was it like a false panic, or do you think it was like a real? Well, I, you know, I think Silicon Valley Bank was a good bank. I mean, right now there are a lot of, you know, uh, naysayers that it was poor bank and poor management, and mm -hmm. you can point up a lot of things that maybe they should have done differently. They certainly didn't need to sell their securities portfolio. They could have pledged it and borrowed. But, but they had a plan. They knew that they, you know, were going to take mm -hmm. a loss. They, they had a lot of capital. And they could have raised more, but I, I, I think you know that the tech industry, yeah, for some reason got spooked, and and I, they got spooked because ninety five percent of the deposits were uninsured, and they thought, yeah. what if we, what if it does go under and we lose it? What happens? Yeah, and and I, I think when Peter, you know, said I'm pulling out my money and sent out texts saying. Peter Till. Yeah, yeah, you pull out your money. It was over. <laughs> it was just over. And and the sad thing, I think, about that is that Silicon Valley Bank was their bank. I mean, <laughs> it I was set up for them. And uh, uh, they didn't need to do it. I don't know why they got spooked. I mean, frankly, you know. I, that was a weird weekend because it seemed like, and by the way, thank you for everything you did during, yeah. during all of that. And it was fun to um, have you on that town hall yeah. and uh, that that Monday. Like it felt like that Monday. Like the whole weekend, the whole community was coming together, and we were like, "What's yeah. going to happen?" It's like almost the world was ending. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. For some, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, it was like over. Yeah. Like just as quickly as it was like this huge crisis, yeah. it was immediately over. Yeah. Um, what did you think, like? When when you saw that and you saw like just how vulnerable a bank like Silicon Valley Bank is, what have you had you ever experienced anything like that in your career? No, I I, I hadn't, and uh, you know I but but I I think it points up some of the fund, fundamentals. You know that if you're if if you're specialized, mm -hmm. if you're concentrated, that concentration has a real risk. Mm -hmm. And and that it works when the music's playing and when the music stops. If you don't have backup, you know it. There's real problems. And uh, and and I think what what happened. The, the risk was is that all their deposits were were held by a very few people. And yeah. and uh, and those people controlled the deposits of multiple other customers. Yeah. You know. So when one decided it was time to pull out. Not only did they do it, but they yeah. they told everyone else to, you know, and and we've never seen that happen before, uh, and we've never seen it happen through social media and through <laughs> online uh, withdrawals, where where people Silicon Valley Bank never had the people come in to talk to them about it. Yeah. it just happened overnight, and uh, but but I but I think they they were. They were a real outlier in that, in in that sense, you know, mm -hmm. where other banks, most other banks, aren't like that. I mean, they have a granular deposit base, uh, and the same thing couldn't happen, or sh shouldn't be able to happen in the same degree. Yeah, George Jones had that old song about like who's gonna fill their shoes, talking about like Hank yeah. Williams and like the. I wonder like who's gonna fill Silicon Valley Bank shoes now? Do you? Do well, I, I don't. That? I don't think anyone will, and certainly, Silicon Valley Bank's not going to be resurrected by their purchaser. You know? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, obviously, we have a, a tech group, you know, that's headed by Jennifer Christopoulos and Sam Clark, and and we're out there lending. But um, 
it, it's it's different. You're you're looking at things differently. And I think the other thing that this uh, sort of highlighted is that as interest rates have gone up, not only has that made deposits more expensive for banks, it's made capital uh, more expensive for the funds right. and more difficult to, to to raise. And and when capital and money was cheap. It was easy to invest in a lot of things because yeah. there's no cost to it. And now that money is more expensive, you know, you're going to be, I think, more careful on on what you invest in and how long you invest and how patient you are. Yeah. And and so I see a lot of tech companies um, in the medical field coming to hospital systems saying, "Will you acquire us? You mm-hmm. know, we're worried that we're not going to get the money." And they have good technologies. Or their fintechs are coming to the banks and saying, what about acquiring us? You know, and so yeah. it's, it's uh, I think there's going to be a consolidation, but it, as well as sort of a, a, a death for many, many businesses and fewer startups. Were you uh, surprised by kind of like the blowback or kind of like the shrapnel that was felt on, a, on other kind of regional banks, including Zions Bank during yeah, the I, I, Silicon Valley I, 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 I was, and, and I was surprised by that. But I think it goes back to the media. that They're trying to sell a story. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, which was a favorite of the industry and a mm-hmm. favorite of, of, of the investors, uh, surprised everyone. Yeah. And so they were trying to figure out why did they fail and who has the same characteristics and who will be the next one to fail. Yeah. But they, they um, unfortunately, I think a lot of reporters, they're not specialized. They're not experts in their field like yeah. they used to be. And, and uh, so they don't understand uh, balance sheets or they don't understand how banks work or the difference. And, and so they, they would look and say, well, who else has – a large investment portfolio, yeah. or who else is lending to the tech industry, or um, who else uh, has a large uninsured deposit base, you know, and uh, and and so a number of regional banks were targeted because they may have one or or the other, and and um, you know yeah. that 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 encouraged a lot of shorters to get into the stock. And once they're in the stock, their goal is to drive it down further. And uh, uh, but then, you know, eventually, as I like to say, truth comes out. Yeah. And, and the stock goes up and the shorters lose and leave. <laughs> it was funny. In fact, it, it's, having you say that reminds me during that time, I think it was a reporter from The New York Times uh, reached out to Silicon Slopes and they wanted to talk about Zions Bank. And I get on a call with this reporter. I can't remember who it was. And he was like, yeah, I think Zions Bank is going to get acquired by Wells Fargo this week. I'm like, I don't <laughs> think you understand yeah. the significance, the historical significance yeah. of Zions Bank, how strong this institution yeah. is, how tied to the state of Utah it is. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the very founding of the state. We're like, I'm like, I yeah. don't think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this little Silicon Valley Bank thing is going to happen yeah. like that. But I'd love to ask you about that, actually. Like, um, it, it Zions Bank really is beyond a bank in this state. Mm-hmm. You support so many different initiatives, so, much, so many different causatives. You, you support so many different community organizations, and on and on and on. What What is in Zions' ethos that makes it so that you do that? Well, I think, uh, you know, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary this mm-hmm. year. And if you go back to 1873, when Science Bank was founded by a, a group of local business people headed up by Brigham Young, you know, he said that he wanted to create an institution that would become one of the most uh, beneficial for the entire territory and, and that would provide benefits for all the people and all the businesses to, and help the communities thrive. That, mm-hmm. That's what he said. And at that point, the territory of, of uh, Deseret, as it was called, included not only Utah, but part of Wyoming and Nevada and Arizona, and it went down to San Diego. So yeah. it was a, a, large, a large piece of land. And so from the very beginning, the idea was is that 
we were here to create value. Value, obviously, for our clients, but value for our communities. And that means giving back where we can. It means being involved in community issues. It means trying to find creative solutions, financial solutions for uh, community problems. Yeah. And, and it means being a local bank. And that means having a strong relationship, not only with your customers, but with the communities in which you live and work. And so the bank has tried to do that. And over the last 150 years, I hope that that vision that Brigham Young had has sort of come to pass, that we are uh, the heart of the community, that we are providing access to capital, but more than that, that we are there to provide and create value yeah. for our communities. Do you ever stop and think, like, I have the same role that Brigham Young had on <laughs> No, <laughs> and a lot and of I don't <laughs> like actually Zions, Zions Bank's history is kind of interesting, right? It's it is pretty closely tied to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Saints, at least in its founding, right? Mm -hmm. Like for a while, the the what was the president of the church also the president of the bank? It was, yeah. It, how long did that go on for? It went on t uh, until uh, David O. McKay, who was president of the church and president of the bank, mm -hmm. and that was in the nineteen sixty. And he decided that the church should no longer be in the banking business. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the church owned or controlled three banks, and, and they were all in Salt Lake, and they all had only one branch, and the, uh, they had in total about $100 million in deposits. And so David O. McKay merged them all together. One was the National Bank of Salt Lake, one was Zion Savings and Loan, and the other was Utah Savings and Loan. And when he merged them together, he renamed it Zion's yeah. uh, 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 First National Bank, combining the names. And then he sold the church's interest in it to Roy Simmons and a group of investors. So since 1960, the church really hasn't been involved at yeah. all. And... Um, and since about 1990, no church officials have been on the bank's board. And and so it's a public company. Yeah. It, it's owned by the public and shareholders. And uh, the church probably has less than 4% of the, the, the shares. They, yeah. It's small enough that they don't have to report it. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. Uh, when did, how did you get your start in the in the whole industry? How did you get your start? Well, you know, I've I've always been fascinated with banking, yeah. and it it it, it stretches back uh, to my youth when uh, my cousin and I decided we wanted to go into business together. And uh, at that point, you know, the the fad was to make your own root beer. You'd buy the extract, you'd buy the yeast, you'd mix it together, and we went out and collected wine bottles and washed them and put the root beer in the right wine bottles, uh, and. Uh, and, and then we let it aged, and my grandfather funded it. He gave us a loan. That's <laughs> awesome. Know? And uh, wine bottles are not good for root beer, and uh, uh, they, it, they burst, and we lost uh, everything. <laughs> but my grandfather didn't release us from the agreement to pay him back. Right. You know? and, and I thought at that point, you know, it's a lot better to be a lender than a borrower, and so I thought I want to go into banking, and I'm I'm intrigued and, and sort of amazed by the idea of banking that you can take one dollar of deposits and lend out seven dollars in loans, right. and it, and it it works. You you have that uh, multiplier effect, yeah, and, and it does work. Where did you go to school? Um, I, I college. I went to the University of Utah, and then I transferred to Columbia University, and then I went to Johns Hopkins. And did you study uh, banking, or did you study economics? Did you I study... studied economics oh, okay. and accounting and international studies. And then when you graduated uh, from John Hopkins in, in Columbia and then the U, of course, like kind of the those three combined, did you come back to Utah? And No, I, I started my career at Bank of America oh, in okay. San Francisco, and uh, then they sent me to Tokyo where I— spent about six years in international banking 
um, and then I came back to San Francisco, and and then and uh, then I I was recruited by Zions Bank, and I came back here. What was your experience in Tokyo like? Well, it was fabulous. You know, when I was there with with Bank of America, Bank of America was the largest bank in the world. Yeah, and they got took good care of their expatriates. But but banking was really exciting. I was involved in the international trade side, and, and Bank of America had a number of what they called merchant banks throughout Asia that I was uh, involved in. Wow. That must have been an incredible time to be a part of that. It was fabulous. Yeah. And I love the Japanese culture. Yeah. Do you visit there? Go back and we visit? We have been back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very cool. Why is Utah so important to you personally? Well, Utah is important because when it's my home and and uh, my uh, family ha- has been here, they uh, my ancestors came across in the first wagon train. They 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 came into the valley on July twenty fourth, you know, eighteen forty seven, yeah. and uh, we we've been here ever since. But I th- I think more than that. Utah is just a great place. You know, it's it's a vibrant place. It's it's growing, but it's still small enough that you can have a real impact and mm-hmm. that you can uh, 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 talk to the governor or talk to the president of the church or talk to the chamber of commerce or talk to the CEO of Silicon Slopes <laughs> and and it you you have a chance to to make a difference. And with Zions Bank here, you, you know, with its history. It, it's really a platform to do a lot of good. Yeah. What have you learned about leadership during your tenure at Zions Bank? And, you know, you've, you've worked with a lot of governors over the years, senators, congressmen, I mean, on and on and on, right? Speakers of the House, Senate yeah. presidents, things of that nature. What have you learned about leadership that would be of value to those who are uh, leading companies or part of the tech community? Uh, or just generally, what have you what have you learned from some of these incredible well, I, leaders? I, I think, uh, you know, I've learned a couple of things about leadership. And when I was with Bank of America, you know, I was involved in some of the high tech lending they did, uh, and and uh, you know, I I, I saw where uh, you know where they would make loans and they didn't make loans, and 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 the impact it could have, but. But the great leaders that I've seen, you know, and what I've learned from them is that they have the ability to inspire people to dream. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to inspire people to learn. They have the ability to inspire people to do more and to become more. And, And by doing that, they're able to attract and retain great people that are working from them for them because they give them a platform that they can share ideas that work. Mm-hmm. And, and by doing that, they have a real influence. And it's not like they are always in the spotlight, but it's because they are there driving the show and encouraging and inspiring and motivating people to achieve what they can achieve, you know, a common mm-hmm. goal. And, and I think what, when you see them, uh, these leaders have the ability to bring together ideas and people and money and organizations to accomplish things that others would say are not possible. Yeah. I want to get into some of like the rain clouds or challenges that, co- that come ahead here for the state of Utah. But what makes Utah so special when it comes to the ability to create companies, the community aspect of this? Uh, I mean, we're a state of three million people is all, and we have a top five tech ecosystem yeah. in the world, and that's just one aspect of, of this kind of vibrant economy. We're normally the number one yeah. economy in the country every year. How does that happen? But, you know, I think to understand that, at least as I've thought about that, you know, you, you have to go back in history, and you look at the you know, founding of, of uh, Utah, and you had people – migrants, uh, immigrants coming into to the area uh, and working together to create uh, a, a new home here. And, and you look at the, the leadership that was uh, 
that they had, both in men and women. And uh, you saw how women from Utah led uh, the the the. Uh, uh, the, the movement to bring uh, uh, to vote to vote for yeah. women and Utah was the first state where yeah. women voted in Absolutely. a municipal election, and it was the first state where women were given the vote in their con- in the constitution, um, and and then we went through a period, um, you know, not long ago where where the economy was not great here it was flat yeah and people would graduate and there weren't jobs and they moved out it was cheap to live here but there weren't a lot of opportunities. And then I think uh, the leaders of this state said, we need to change that. And they they developed uh, policies where they would balance the budget. Uh, They they became business friendly. They encouraged business to to grow and develop. And, And you saw a lot of things happening and all of a sudden, the economy became very diverse. It wasn't based on agriculture alone. It wasn't based on energy. It wasn't Mm -hmm. based on tourism. It wasn't based on technology. It wasn't based on mining. It was a very diverse economy. And that created a lot of opportunities in a lot of different areas that attracted a lot of people to come. And then when there were economic issues in the nation, Utah had that strength of diversity that, that made a difference, that it kept its economy going and growing and thriving. And I think that has made, made the difference. And I think the secret sauce is that government and businesses and organizations like Silicon Slope come together and say, what do, can we do? What do we need to do to make Utah thrive, to make the economy better? And, and in a lot of states, a lot of countries you don't have that yeah but we do have it here and i think that's part of the reason that we have our economy has thrived and business has grown and uh you know the legislature wanted it to be the center of industrial uh banking and it is they wanted it to be the center of technology and uh it's one of the centers in 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 the country Uh, and uh it wanted it to be, you know, a place where people would visit, and we have high tourism rates, and, yeah. and, and almost so, too much. <laughs> almost too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Do you think Governor Levitt gets enough credit for kind of spark? Like I, when I look back at like, well, how did all this start? And it, it kind of goes like to Governor Levitt making all those trips to Silicon Valley talking to business leaders, beginning to think about, like, how do you expand the economy? And I'm sure all of this was happening yeah. before Governor Levitt, too. But yeah. but he also got the Olympics here, yep. right? Which I think 2002 and the Olympics really changed the trajectory of the yeah. state. Uh, what did you learn from him? I'm sure that you were close with well, him. Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think he saw the importance of uh, bringing the Olympics to the state. And, and I think the, the, what that showed is that it, it, it brought Utah to the national platform. And we put on a great Olympics. We had a great volunteer a core of, of people that ran it. And mm-hmm. so it, it was, we had great leadership in Mitt Romney and, and Fraser Bullock and, and uh, Bob Garf. And, and so the, uh, it went off without a flaw in a very difficult time, yeah. if you think back Because then, the, pre- the, the one right before that was not that successful, is that right. right? That's right. Yeah, there was like even some questions about how do we continue doing this? Yeah, and, and then we had 9-11, and yeah. we still went on, and we, we had a surplus, and, and it's continued to fund uh, uh, the uh, Olympic venues. But then I think he also decided that we needed to make great progress. So he created uh, the Western Governors University, mm-hmm. and, and now it has, if I remember the numbers right, 500,000 students. It, 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 it graduates 50,000 students a year, mm-hmm. and it graduates uh, 18% of all of the nurses in the country. And, and it's, it's on a different platform than most universities. You get credit for what you know, uh, and you can go at your own speed, and it's all online. Yeah, you know. Uh, but then he also, I, I think, uh, saw that uh, that Utah could have been the number one state in medical devices, 
and and we blew that opportunity. Interesting. And and he decided that was not going to happen with the tech industry. Yeah. You know, and so he, uh, from what I saw, you know, he really made uh, outreach to the tech industry in Silicon Valley and other places, North yeah. Carolina. And, and he, uh, with the legislature, passed laws that made it attractive to be here. Uh, they, they, uh, and then as Huntsman came in, they passed uh, the uh, U-Star that funded $14 mm -hmm. million dollars a year in research at the University of Utah and Utah State. Yeah. Uh, they, they passed uh, the, uh, the, the uh, bill that set up you know, uh, tech lending and, and uh, investments. Yeah, and and um, and and it made a huge difference in in providing money and capital uh, to invest in companies, to increase companies to come in, and and I th I think the rest is history. Yeah, and Huntsman did. Um, he brought he opened up World Trade Center Utah. He did. Right? He launched the Governor's Office of Economic Development. He did, which is was so big yeah. for the, for this state at the time. And yeah, I actually forgot about U Star. But U-Star was this incredible program, yeah. uh, particularly partnering with universities and getting that research yeah. into becoming like actual companies. Yeah, we've been fortunate with who our governors are yeah. and kind of their forethought and leadership early on to kind of get us to where we are today. We, we have been, and it's continued. You know, you, you saw it in Olene Walker it, with her emphasis on education mm -hmm. and uh, that brought engineering, you know, more engineering students you, you saw it, I, I, again, as we said, with, with Huntsman. You, you saw it with Herbert, and you're seeing it with Cox, where, where you know, they, they know yeah. what, what makes things happen. And, and they have a leg legislature that understands. Yeah. How do you think, like, as the state grows, and like you said, like, it, it used to be completely different 20, 30 years ago. Like, if you really wanted to have a career in technology or even in banking, I, I would assume, or, or these other careers, you kind of had to leave Utah and come back after that was, you know, and yeah. like it was, it was hard to recruit talent to the state of Utah because they were like, well, if I come and work at this company and it doesn't work out, then I have to move again. I have to yeah. move out of the state again. That's no longer true. Yeah. And that's no longer true to like a crazy degree yeah. where like, yeah, you can come work at any of these tech companies. It doesn't work out. You're going to get a job at one of the other ones, yeah. uh, right? Assuming you're like a great talent. How do we manage this growth yep. that we're seeing now and all the challenges that come with the yep. growth? Well, I, th I think, again, if you go back in history, you know, you, you look at WordPerfect. Uh -huh. And, and uh, you know, WordPerfect uh, started by two students at BYU. And, and, uh, and, and then as it grew, uh, a lot of uh, employees left and started up their own businesses. Mm -hmm. And then WordPerfect was oh, sold. Yeah. And, and, and so that, I think that was the seed that really got a lot of people here. It got them involved in the tech business. They saw the, the value of the business. They saw the opportunity in the business. They saw how it could create wealth. Uh, and, and so they got into it. And, and with that birth of, of that whole industry, uh, you had a number of other companies grow and develop. And, and that brought people back to the state because you knew that if you joined Word Perfect and you were let go, there were three other mm -hmm. businesses that you could go to for a job. And, and, and so it, it, it really made, made a difference. I think now the, the uh, headwinds that we face is the tight labor market. Yeah. And, and we need to do, and I think our governor and our legislature needs to do all it can to continue to increase the growth in the population, to increase uh, the movement to uh, uh, bring people to Utah yeah. and, and uh, so that we can uh, have the people to drive the growth in the business instead of now where one company will steal from the other, the wages go yeah. up and everything becomes more expensive, but we still don't have the people to fill all of the jobs. How do you think the Fed's doing right now? Like these, the rising of the interest rates seems like interest rates are going to stay high for a while now. What do you think of our current like economic policy in this country? I mean, since COVID, it must be completely different than anything yeah. you've ever seen. Well, I, I I think again, if you go back in history, the rates today 
are what many would say yeah, of my true. generation are normal. <laughs> you know, I remember if you got a seven percent mortgage, you thought that was a great rate. Yeah, you know, and uh, but so, so I, I and and I think people are adjusting to the rate. They're they're seeing that. I think as rates were climbing, it was a shock to them because everyone was used to free money, mm-hmm. and and uh, with mortgage rates in the two percent range. You tended to borrow more, and you bought bigger homes. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the number of loans that we're seeing is still at the same level, but the size of the loans, what is being borrowed, is much less. And so people are buying smaller homes. They're putting down larger down payments. Businesses are are still borrowing, but they are conserving their cash, and they are are, 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 – they're more careful in how they spend because there's a cost of money. So I think that's really good. There's a cost of money, and so you do your analysis better, and you're more careful in where where, where you place it. Um, I I I think the the future of the economy. I don't think we will see a recession. I, you know, I and and I think you know rates are, are have gone up. Uh, but growth has continued. Uh, labor has continued to be tight, even though jobs are incre- increasing, which we've never s- seen before in the economy. Yeah. Um, and I think the Fed is 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 concerned that uh, uh, inflation may stall around four percent and not get down to two. Um, but I think the Fed will probably increase rates. You know, another time when they meet in September, mm-hmm. I think then they will hold off to see what what happens, um, and I think people will, will ad- adjust to our higher rate environment, and and I think actually that's good because there is a cost to money. Money isn't free, yeah. and I th- I think there's been a whole generation that has been. Uh, 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 raised on the idea that the money yeah. should be free. <laughs> we had a whole decade of free money. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. Yeah. yeah. And now we're seeing the opposite, kind of more yeah. of like a reality check. Do you think the Fed looks out for regional banks in the same way they look out for like the big four yeah. uh, and kind of these big, these banks that are quote unquote too big to fail? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think the Fed's uh, uh, mission is to ensure that we are at full in employment uh-huh. and to ensure that the um, uh, uh, economy is un- uh, the inflation is under control so the economy will grow um, and they are, are are to ensure that the safety and soundness of the banking industry and I, th- I think what what's interesting is that when Silicon Valley Bank failed uh-huh. if you recall here in Utah led by you and Silicon Slopes uh-huh. uh, we got involved uh, the industry got involved. The governor got involved uh, over the weekend, saying, "What can we do on Monday yeah. to make sure that businesses, if they needed cash to make payroll, we could give it to them?" Yeah. And I, th- I think the Fed and and the Treasury Se- uh, Secretary Yellen was concerned about that. That if if the uh, Monday came and and Silicon Valley Bank was still being uh, controlled by the FDIC and the funds were not available, mm-hmm. that, that a lot of businesses wouldn't have the cash that was in their savings account and checking account to make payroll. Yeah. And then you'd have layoffs, you'd have businesses fail, and, and it would be a, a real economic disaster. Yeah. And so she made uh, you, you know, all of the deposits, both insured and uninsured, available 100% on Monday. Yeah. Which was terrific for the economy. Crisis over. The Just crisis that one thing. should have been over. <laughs> but but what it did is is that it created an unintended consequence of a two tiered banking system. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah where, okay. Where uh, if you were, and it raised the question: Who is too big to fail? Uh, and Silicon Valley Bank was determined to be too big to fail. Um, and, and so the question was, if you were too big to fail, then whether your deposits were insured or not insured, they were safe. You know, you'd be made whole. Yeah. And if you were not too big to fail, then if your deposits weren't insured, you know, uh, you could lose them or lose part of them. 
Yeah. And and so I, I think that's the issue that the Treasury and the uh, Fed and the, the OCC and uh, is struggling with now. How do we overcome what we created? And I think what's interesting is at the same time that people talk about too big to fail, you have the progressive members of Congress saying these same banks that are too big to fail are too big to manage. And if you recall, you know, uh, uh, prior to the f failure of Silicon Valley Bank, some in Congress were calling for the big banks to be broken up, yeah. that they were too big to manage. Yeah. And, and so there's a, a real discrepancy <laughs> with, with, with what has come out of the Silicon Valley Bank yeah. failure. And I think uh, Secretary Yellen is, is trying to adjust to that. The FDIC is trying to look at uh, uh, FDIC insurance reform that, that may insure all deposits, which would again create uh, a level playing field. But, but I, I, that's, that's, that's the, the question. But I think what people need to understand is that, that the banking system is really sound. There's plenty of capital. Credit quality right now is really good. Mm -hmm. And the smaller banks, the uh, regional banks, uh, they tend to lend more to small business and to startups than do the national banks. Yeah. And, and they tend to be more of a community player, uh, and, and you don't want to lose that. You don't want to end up like Canada with four or five banks, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're lucky to have you know, 5,000 banks yeah. of all sizes that, that have different risk structure and, and risk appetites uh, that, that uh, I may lend to one company where another may, uh, bank may not, but together we're all in this together. I totally agree with that. I think regional banks are the lifebloods of community a lot of yeah. time. And uh, no, no better example of that than Zions Bank and what you've done in your tenure and what Zions Bank has done throughout its history and, and being so engaged in the fabric of the state of mm -hmm. Utah. Whereas like, you're not going to get that from a New York City bank being mm -hmm. engaged in the fabric of the state of Utah. Like, one, why would they? And two, like, they've got yeah. other things that they're doing, yeah. right? Like it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense, but yeah, I I, I totally agree that regional banks are critical yeah. to the country. Well, and you not only see that in banking, but but uh, as large companies, you know, are sold and the headquarters move out of a state, mm -hmm. you know, their their participation in the state lessens, even though they say it won't. Mm -hmm. And you see it with some of our major companies mm -hmm. that were uh, really involved in the community uh, that are, are now subsidiaries of other companies uh -huh. that are headquartered elsewhere, and we don't get the same attention or the same community involvement that we had when they were headquartered here. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. What do you think of Fitch downgrading the um United States credit rating. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> Who would have thought of that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but, but regardless of what they did, I, I think the action shows uh, that, one, they were concerned about the level of debt. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, but if you go beyond that, the economy is still the strongest economy in the world. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, uh, it, it's unlikely that, that the U.S. economy will fail. Uh, I, I think, though, when they saw that Congress was uh, teetering on uh, not approving mm -hmm. the debt ceiling and would the uh, uh, country default on its debt, uh, that was a real concern. And, I, 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 you know, I, I, I criticized Congress for, for bringing us to, the, to that tipping yeah. point. You know, that should never happen. And and uh, and I think that, along with the size of the debt, you know, wor worries the uh, Fitch, and yeah. and so they 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 downgrade it. But still, uh, you know, what what uh, better investment than something that's backed by the full faith of the yeah. U.S. government? 
Yeah, it's interesting. Like the politics behind even the downgrade is interesting. Yeah. But it did seem like the main concern for them was like it's the state of our politics yeah. and how dysfunctional it's become. What's your take on that? Like when you look at, I mean, again, like Utah's named best managed state, best economy, all these types of things year after year after year. But when you look at the country as a whole and various states, like it, there is something weird yeah. going on. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, um, I, 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 I blame it on the media, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, with social media and, you know, the soundbite becomes so important mm -hmm. and, it, and it's so hard to determine uh, is, is this statement that's coming across social media true or not. And if you're a politician and you want to get uh, attention and you want to be quoted, it has to be short, it has to be concise, and it has to be alarming. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think that has rubbed off on how people interact with each other. Um, you know, if you go back in history, I, again, with Senator Hatch, a conservative and Senator Kennedy, a very liberal senator, they were able to disagree vehemently on issues, but they were able to come together on on issues to pass some of the most important legislation this country has seen, the mm -hmm. America's, uh, American for Disabilities Act, the Children's Health Insurance, Religious Freedom, and the Labor Act. It goes on and on and on. And it shows that if people can, that people can work together, they can disagree. But now it seems like that if you negotiate, you're selling out. You know, yeah. and, and that's, I don't think that's true. I, I think that you can hold to your principles and still come up with the best plan that's available uh, uh, for the good of the country and the good of the people. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at like Washington, D.C. and what seems like dysfunction there, I mean, what how do we fix that? Well, I, I, I think, you know, the people just have to say we're not going to take it anymore. Yeah. You know, but but uh, uh, even and and we do polls, a lot of polling, and yeah. and people don't like what's happening in Washington, and they don't like the bickering, and they don't like uh, 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 the the uh, hatred that that comes out. But that's what they react to, yeah. and and so people do it. Uh, one of the things that Governor Cox is trying to do uh, in his term as chair of the National Governors Association is to change that and mm -hmm. say we can disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable, yeah. that, that we can work together. And uh, he wants to try and do all he can to change that in politics and in, in lawmaking and, and just in society in general. But, yeah. but uh, to do that, uh, we the people have to react differently. And and uh, we we have to say, you know, we're not we're not going to take it anymore. Yeah. What do you think of the inland port and the pro and the progress that's made and the way it's changed and yeah. um, been negotiated over time? Do you feel like we're in a good spot there? Well, I'm a big believer in the inland port. Yeah. And and uh, I, I was in Hong Kong uh, with Governor Herbert and we met with the Chung family who I'd. Uh, controlled um, OCC, one of the largest shippers in the, in the country. And they said, we would love to see an inland port in Utah to take the pressure off uh, LA and Lo uh, Long Beach and, and Seattle and San Francisco. And so, um, you know, we came back and we had uh, the Gardner Institute do some studies, uh, feasibility studies. Uh, the legislature thought it was a good idea and funded uh, further research. And, and I think it's a great opportunity. I think from a business point of view, it'll bring more business to Utah. I think from an environmental point of view, it will make our environment better because as an inland port, you can say, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you can't drive a truck that, that's, mm -hmm. that's not uh, uh, environmentally beneficial. Uh, you, 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 there's a lot on rails, and and I I, I think from every aspect, uh, it's it's good for the economy, uh, and it's good for the environment, um, and I think people are starting to see this, you know, and I think that that we're making progress in 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 this, and I think you see the benefit 
uh, when uh, you know the ships were piled up in the ports, and and we had a huge supply issue of mm-hmm. getting uh, 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 goods, silicon slip, uh, silicon chips in particular, yes. off the, the 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 ships, that that they were able to contract with our inland port, and said we will ship the containers to you and and let you help us process them. Yeah. What do you make of the explosion of Southern Utah? I was just down there this weekend in, in yeah. St. George. And man, that is, it's like there's traffic everywhere you go. It's yeah. like, th- it's developments yeah. everywhere you go. Yeah. It's incredible what's happening down there. Yeah. And, you know, now the rebranding of the university with Utah Tech University, I see coming in really big down there. I know that Zions Bank is, is really big down there. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, I, I think there's land. The, yeah. the, uh, uh, the, it's a great place to live. The weather is good, uh, and uh, 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 businesses are coming there. It used to be, as you recall, a retirement community. Mm-hmm. It no longer is. Uh, we, we, you know, people had a lot of second homes there. And when, the, when the economy faltered, there was a lot of uh, uh, defaults, and and uh, the, the values just dropped. But then people realized it's, it doesn't need to be a retirement community. It can be a business community, mm-hmm. and that's what it's becoming. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the other big project going on in the state right now is the Point of the Mountain. Yeah. And that whole area and tract of land, how important do you think that is to the future of the state? Well, I, I think there's several uh, projects that are important to the state. Obviously, the Point of the Mountain. And what I like about the Point of the Mountain is that it really will connect uh, you know, Utah County with Salt Lake County yeah. in a way that it's never been connected mm-hmm. uh, before. And and it gives uh, the state, which owns the land and is controlling the development, an opportunity to really build what they want there, that, to fulfill their vision. Uh, but I think you see what is happening on North Temple in, in what is being called the Power District mm-hmm. by the state fairgrounds. Uh, with uh, plans for a major league baseball stadium, yeah. with with a new tower for uh, 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 the power company, with with a, uh, that will bring new life and business. You know what, what is it? 150 acres. Yeah. And then you look at uh, Mayor Mendenhall's plan to create an, an entertainment district in in Salt Lake that would go from State Street to to uh, Third West. And and uh, you know it, it include uh, the jazz, uh, yeah. include uh, uh, hopefully a, a, a national hockey team, a, a soccer mm-hmm. team, uh, as as well as you know uh, the Eccles Theater and the Symphony Hall and yeah. and everything else. So I think there are a lot of things that are going to change the face of Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County, and bring Weber and Davis County and Utah County closer together. Yeah. Yeah, there is a bit of a divide, huh, between Salt Lake County and Utah County still. It's still hard to get people to go one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the beneficial thing that Salt Lake County has going for them is the Utah Jazz are there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Utah County, if you want to go see yeah. Jazz, you have to go up there yeah. no matter what. Um, yeah. Whereas, like, the reverse isn't true. There's not really a professional team down here. Do you think we'll get a Major League Baseball team? I, I think we will. Yeah, I, I think, think we, we will, will, too. Yep. I think that that would be so incredible. Yep. When you think about value, creating value, Zion's Bank role in creating value in a community, what does all of that mean to you? Well, I, I, I think it comes back to what I consider uh, the, 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 the mission and the vision of banks you know, uh, to provide capital and access to capital to individuals and businesses to help them grow and and expand, and and I think by doing that they create this value that's so important for uh, um, uh, cu- customers, for businesses in particular, but also for communities. And I think when you see communities that lose a bank and have no bank in there, they don't grow like communities that have a bank. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so I, I think Utah is blessed because it has a strong banking uh, uh, um, environment, 
but it also is blessed because it has an industrial loan bank uh, industry here and the largest in in the country mm-hmm. and and while they don't do a lot of lending locally uh, uh, under the CRA rules they contribute a lot to this community uh, uh, be, because of the CRA uh, CRA rules, so yeah. so we benefit hugely from from them. And by the way, Zions Bank is not just a Utah bank. I mean, I go to Boise, and it feels like yeah. uh, like Salt Lake City too. You yeah. know, and I see like Zions Bank uh, yeah. towers and th- and things like that. What's the interest in Boise and Idaho in general? Well, you know, uh, Idaho is a good economy. Yeah, it's, it's not great economy. quite as strong as as Utah, but it's growing rapidly. And and it's a great opportunity. Zions is actually in in uh, Washington, Oregon, California, Utah, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas in physical branches. Yeah. Uh, uh, we don't always use the Zions name, uh, but it's all part of the same bank. Uh, and and we are in um, uh, forty seven states with with uh, banking operations like public finance, uh, small business finance, um, and and uh, uh, financing of dentists and and uh, and uh, other professional groups. And so uh, we are really a, a, a regional bank in every sense. and yeah. uh, we're one of the largest locally owned and uh, headquartered regional banks uh, west of the Mississippi. What is the future of banking? You mentioned branches and things like that. I actually went, uh, we obviously bank with Science Bank or yeah. Silicon Slopes, and I think we had to sign something, so we went into a branch. And yeah. like it just seems like, are branches going to be a thing 10, 20 years from now? Well, I, I, I think they will, but I think banking is becoming uh, more virtual and, and more digital, and, mm-hmm. and people will have the option of banking on their uh, uh, mobile device. Uh, they'll have the option of going in and talking with someone if they want at a branch. And, and I think that combination of really strong technology and really strong personal service if you want it is, is a combination that fintech companies don't have. Mm-hmm. And, and I think a lot of fintech companies now are, are trying to partner with banks yeah. to have that uh, uh, personal touch. Uh, but I view this technology as not replacing your banker, but as making it easier for you to interact with your banker in the way that you want. Yeah. How come you've never run for office? Because <laughs> I'm a banker. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be great at it, though. What do you hope your legacy is as uh, the head of Zions for? I mean, you've been such a phenomenal foundational leader in this community for for such an incredible amount of time leading again one of the most important if not the most important institutions yeah. in the entire state what do you hope your legacy is well i i'm smart enough to know that that i i'm i'm very lucky and blessed to be in the biz- position i am but but uh the you know the the real star is is zion's bank it's the organization and it's the people that are 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 with it and you know i i think that not only are we in banking, but as you know, I, th- I think we're the second largest tech company in you Utah yeah. in, in terms of uh, uh, employers, tech employees. Um, but but I but I, I I hope that 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 uh, I can help and uh, science to continue its its mission of becoming uh, and being uh, one of the most important institutions in the state to help the state and and business and citizens grow and create value yeah well scott i can't thank you enough for all your support over the years of silicon slopes and the tech industry in general and everything you've done for this state it means a lot it means a lot for you to come here and be on the show and again i can't thank you enough i I don't know that um uh this story's really been told but even during like the silicon valley bank stuff the way that whole weekend it took all of our weekends away and and you were there and you were uh, insuring, uh, companies that, Hey, well, you're going to make payroll. Mate. We'll yeah. make sure it happens. And it's just beautiful to have someone like you in an institution like well, Zion. Well, you're kind, but I, I want to thank you, you know, <laughs> and I want to thank Silicon Slopes. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 uh, so critical what, what you're doing and what you're bringing and, and the businesses, the industries that are being created, the jobs that are being created, 
the wealth that's being created and it's all staying here because of silicon yeah. slopes where before it would leave well it's beautiful to have homers right it's beautiful to have people who uh no matter what they're yep. going to care about utah they're going to stay in utah people like ryan smith yeah who's like i'm just going to go all in on utah yep. he could go anywhere he could do anything yeah it's like i'm going to buy the nba team and yep. we're just going to double down on this thing yeah that, that's pretty beautiful and uh, I think he's taken his lead from you and, and folks yeah. like you who um, have done that for so long. And I think it's I think it's really incredible. Well, we so, have a great state and, yeah. and you're an important part of it. So thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for Good. coming on. Thanks. Okay.